Breaking news here on CBS Sports HQ. The new college football AP Top 25 poll is out after chaos occurred yesterday. And things look completely different this week. We have a new number one as the Texas Longhorns move into that top spot after Alabama fell in a shocking game to Vanderbilt as we take a look at the top 10 rankings here. The Buckeyes move up one spot after passing their first true test of the season against Iowa. The Oregon Ducks move into the top five at that third spot after overcoming Michigan State and Penn State. Hello. They move up three spots to number four. Georgia stays put there. As for Bama, they do fall to number six. Tennessee falls out of the top five to number eight after their loss to Arkansas and Ole Miss breaks into the top 10, as does Clemson. Let's move on to 11 through 20 here. Ooh. And there is a tie at 11, a three-team tie um, at 18 as well. Most notable new additions is Texas A&M, who move up from 25 to 15 after their victory over Missouri. Before them, though, BYU, they keep earning some respect, moving up three more spots after they remain undefeated. Indiana also undefeated at 6-0. They move into the top 20, as you see there, coming off a win over Northwestern. And we get you a look at the rest of the teams that round out the new AP Top 25 poll. You'll notice USC, Louisville, UNLV, who were all ranked, have dropped out of the rankings. And the two teams that suffered some big losses this past weekend in Michigan and Missouri fall by double digits in the rankings and your newcomers this week include Pitt who moved to 5-0 and for the very first time in 33 years and SMU who pulled off the upset over Louisville enter the rankings at 25. We're going to dive into all of this and so much more as we welcome you into our CBS Sports HQ studios. I'm Jordan Giorgio alongside Leger Ducible and joining us from the comfort of his own home is Brad Crawford. Guys, we're going to dive into this. Jay, I will start with you here. Bama, as expected, fell in the rankings after yeah. that loss to Vandy. Um, how much, though, did that loss in that game change your perception on this Bama team, if any? I don't think it changed the perception, uh, perception of uh, Alabama. When you look at that team that they played Vanderbilt, their two losses came in one score games. One was Georgia State on the road, and the other was a double overtime thriller versus Mizzou. Diego Pavia in that offense, I knew they were going to score a lot of points. So when it came to this game, Brad, I didn't want to pick a side because I didn't know how the game would go. I took the over, and the over hit in the third quarter, right? When you look at what they do on offense, Vanderbilt, they literally make you defend 53 and a half yards. I mean, from sideline to sideline with the option, with off the option, throwing the ball down the field, the play action pass. And then Diego Pavia with the way he's able to run the football, it hurts teams. I knew this was a tough spot for Bama because I've been on a team where you get a big win, right? You're emotionally charged, and then you have to get back up the next week and play a Vanderbilt team, which you've essentially owned for a better part of a decade, right? So this was a tough spot for Bama. I tell people all week long, there was two games that I were like, teams are on upset alert. It was Louisville playing SMU on, at home, and it was this game, Bama playing Vanderbilt, and people looked at me crazy. Well... Both of those teams won on the road. All you got to do is listen to LeJ. And SMU <laughs> won on the road. So uh, I don't look at Bama different just because I think this is the parody of college football, right? We were talking about this earlier, Brad, in the season that maybe there's three teams, right? It's Bama, Ohio State, and Texas, and everybody else. Well, now it's just two, mm -hmm. Ohio State and Texas and everybody else. Brad, before we um, get what your thoughts are on this, I do want you to listen to something because Vanderbilt GM Barton Simmons was on the Cover 3 podcast last night after they upset Bama. Take a listen to this, you guys. We felt like going into that game we were going to win. And, like, the pain and the – that we've, like, been through to get to that point. Um, and And – like it's 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 a big deal man you know like we like it's, there's been some hard nights and some hard days and like that was that was the that was a big day for us today uh, definitely a big day for Vandy, big day for this fan base. We saw the aftermath after they partied around uh, Broadway. It was oh, yeah. so fun. Brad, just your initial reaction to that. Yeah, shout out Barton Simmons, my former co-worker of several years mm -hmm. here at 24-7 Sports. Just an exciting win for Vanderbilt. I mean, Barton hit it on the nose. Vanderbilt went into that game confident. And from what I saw, Leger, 
Vanderbilt won a bunch of one-on-ones, not just in the first quarter, but throughout the game. I mean, they beat Bama at the point of attack. I know you said you're not too worried about the Crimson Tide. I, I think I am. There were some red flags. I mean, Bama struggled tackling. You know, when they got behind, they were sort of unsure of themselves offensively. And then late in the game, when Bama needed to stop, Vanderbilt, of all teams, converted third down after third down to win that game. So I agreed with the six-spot drop for the Crimson Tide. And now you got to wonder if the, the playoff hopes diminish a little bit because they still got to go to LSU. And, you know, still got some other road games, too, against Tennessee. So that's that's a tough schedule coming up for Bama. Yeah, most definitely. Let's go ahead and get into the teams that fell in the rankings, Brad, specifically in the top 10, and that was Tennessee. They fall to eight after they suffered their first loss of the season to Arkansas. Brad, are the Vols going to have to be close to flawless if they have any chance at this college football playoff? Yeah, Jordan, I think a 10 and 2 finish is going to be good enough to get Tennessee in. But we're talking about having to split now wrote a game against Alabama coming up at Neyland Stadium in a few weeks and then going to Athens, I think it is, to win between the hedges. You you have to split that at worst to get in the playoff. So this was a critical loss for Tennessee. I think a lot of us, Leger, you might want to add something here, but I think a lot of us had Tennessee winning that game against Arkansas, though they would be tested. Arkansas defense played real well. And then Nico, another true road game, played well against OU, did not look as good last night. So this was a surprising loss. Maybe not quite as surprising as Bama's loss to Vandy, but a loss nonetheless that certainly hurts Tennessee's chances. Yeah, Brad, I'm with you. I, I was surprised at this loss. Just knowing that Tennessee's defense, and a lot of people haven't talked about it because the offense is so explosive. And we talked about Samson, the running back, Dylan Samson, and how well he's played. I know people have made a big fuss about Nico and how he's played, but he really struggled uh, last night. And it came down to the wire where they had an opportunity on fourth and five, right? Last play of the game. And he just didn't understand clock management right there. Runs out of bounds and they lose in that fashion. If you're Josh Heupel, you have to be pulling your hair, right? Because you always talk about executing, right? Their offense is up-tempo, up-tempo. And the only way you could have up-tempo offense is if you execute on offense. And they didn't execute it when they needed it the most at the end of the game. So, a little bit surprised. I actually took uh, Tennessee to cover that game on the road. And Arkansas, and it looked like in the beginning of the game, they could potentially run away with it. But, uh, you know, shout-out to Arkansas for, for keeping their head down, working. They, they got it close. Tennessee lets them score at the end so they can get the ball back. Nico has a chance with his offense to be the hero, and they just didn't get it done. And it's going to be a tough road for Tennessee ahead if you look at their schedule. Yeah. You mentioned, Brad, they have Alabama coming to town in just two weeks before they head to Athens to take on Georgia. So quite the schedule ahead of them as we get you a look here at the Vols' upcoming schedule. Let's get to other teams who fell in the rankings, you guys, and fell out of the rankings. That includes Michigan. They fell to 24. USC out of the rankings. Michigan falls to 4-2 and two on the season after their loss to Washington. Did they just play their way out of the playoff? I believe so, but I think they were a long shot to get into the playoffs. We've been talking about this for a while, Brad. Like, mm -hmm. this Michigan team, if you can only do one thing well, it's hard to beat teams in the Big Ten, right? Everybody knows you can run the ball, but what happens when a team slows down Khalil Mullings? Well, we saw what happened last night versus the Washington Huskies. You end up losing a football game, and then they go ahead and make a quarterback change in the middle of that game. They bench Alex Orgy. Jack Tuttle comes in, I believe scores 17 on answer, but two fatal flaws at the end of the game, Brad. The fumble by him and the interception is what cost them to lose this game. So when you can't even threaten people throwing the ball down the field, nobody is going to respect your play action pass, right? So like for Michigan, I think Jordan, a lot of people thought it was a long shot for them to potentially get into the college football playoffs. But I think yesterday kind of signified the end in regards to them making a run at the CFP. Yeah, they are definitely not the same team that we saw last year. Also in the Big Ten, Brad, USC suffered an upset to Minnesota this weekend. What are their chances now to make the college football playoff as they drop totally out of the AP Top 25 rankings? Um, they have a shot to really improve their resume next week against Penn State, but what are their chances right now at the college football playoff? Yeah, I just don't see it happening for Lincoln Riley, Jordan. I mean, Miller Moss, quarterback for the Trojans, has thrown four picks his last three starts. And, and now you face a Penn State defense that's second in the Big Ten, total defense, third in pass defense. 
this is not a good matchup for USC, regardless of the game being in Los Angeles. We know that playing the Coliseum is not much of a home field advantage, despite Penn State having to travel all that way across the country. And I know the record in the Big Ten right now, I think it's one in seven teams that have traveled more than 2,000 miles for games. But, I mean, Penn State, I think, is a legitimate favorite in this game. And USC's back is against the wall. I don't, I don't see this Trojans team finishing 10-2, and two, which is what has to happen, including a Notre Dame win at the end of the year in order to get to the playoff. I don't, I don't see it coming to fruition. Yeah, Brad, this was the question mark for me with USC going into the Big Ten. You know this. This is a grittier type division from the Pac-12 where teams run the football, right? Cold weather uh, stadiums. I wondered, would USC be able to stand up? And I said, week one, LSU gave me hope that they could. But Jordan, Brad, these last two row games have proven that USC is not built for the mm -hmm. Big Ten yet. They haven't, they, they don't, they can't win enough in the trenches, right? They can't win the, the ugly, gritty games. Both losses were ugly, gritty games. Like they, Michigan, you know, muddled it up. Minnesota muddled it up. And I wondered, would USC, with new defensive coordinator DeAnthony Lynn and also Eric Henderson, be able to make enough plays on defense to win gritty games like this? To your point, Brad, Miller Moss turning the football over doesn't help you win gritty games and in both of those games the Michigan game and the Minnesota game he turned it over and if you turn the ball over in gritty games where it's tight you're going to lose it and we saw USC do that on both of their road games in the Big Ten all right we'll see what they do at home this upcoming weekend as they face Penn State it's our Big Ten game of the week on CBS kickoff is slated for 330 that's going to be a good one to watch speaking of Penn State you guys they do move up three spots in the rankings to number four I do want to talk about the Nittany Lions real quick because Penn State has lost each of its past three road games as an AP top five team are they on upset alert as they head out west i don't believe so because of their their two-headed monster at the running back position <laughs> we were just talking about usc versus grittier teams and to brad's point yes they're going to the west coast but it's probably going to be 70 degrees it's not like it's going to be hot or anything so it's not much much of an advantage for the usc uh trojans right i love what i've seen for drew uh drew eller this offense has been clicking on all cylinders and brad you already alluded to what they've done defensive wise this is a defense that's going to always show like the run game and defense travels it will travel for penn state as they take on usc this week brad you I mean, up yeah, Abdul Carter is one of the best defensive players in college football, not only the Big Ten. They're going to send him off the edge early and often against Miller Moss. And if you can shut down Woody Marks at running back, had about 140 yards last night, if Penn State can stack the box and make Miller Moss beat them, then I think that really plays into the advantages in that talent deep secondary for Penn State. So, like I said in the opening, I don't see Penn State on upset alert in this game. Maybe USC surprises me, but USC's eulogy is already being written in the playoff as a team that maybe we thought in the opener was really good after beating LSU, but just a paper champion once again, man. All right, it's going to be a good one on CBS, 3.30 kickoff next week, USC, Penn State. You guys, I do want to touch on Cam Ward and the Miami Hurricanes here for a moment. They move up two spots in the rankings to six. They, they got a huge win over um, Cal this past weekend, headed out west on the road. Did Miami, Brad, save their season, and how much did they really boost their resume with that win? Yeah, I don't think the win really boosted the resume per se, but at this point, being one of the power fours remaining unbeaten means something because so many other elites have a loss already or, or they've been upset. I mean, the Hurricanes have not played their best the last two weeks, but have come back from double-digit deficits in the fourth quarter against Virginia Tech and now Cal on the road to win. So I do think Mario Cristobal and Cam Ward, they're kind of on a crash course to play Clemson or LSU in the ACC championship game, but I don't think Miami's invincible by any means. Right, Defensively, they they've given up some plays. Yeah, they didn't boost maybe their resume, according yeah. to Brad and, and a bunch of other folks, but what they did do, Cam Ward Man. boosted his Heisman Trophy odds. 437 yards, two touchdowns, just one interception. He was an absolute maniac. And, and after Jalen Milrow and Bama's loss, they he fell in the current odds. So now it's Ward, Boise State's Ashton Genty, and Colorado's Travis Hunter yeah. in a three-horse race here. Do you have a new favorite after week six? It's Travis Hunter for me. He's the okay. best player in college football. I love what I've seen from Ashton Genty. I think it's ridiculous. In five games, this guy has 1,000 yards rushing, Jordan. He's averaging over 200 yards rushing a game, and he hasn't even eclipsed 100 carries yet. But Travis Hunter, to be averaging 112 
receiving yards a game. And yet, play on the defensive side where you have two interceptions, right? Nobody is a better zone cover corner than Travis Hunter. Right now, like, people go back and forth. Should he play receiver at the next level? Should he play corner? Just put him out there. It doesn't matter. <laughs> this guy does it all. You see him right here, slant route, interception. You're going to see, I mean, for a touchdown, you're going to see him right here. Watch how he reads the quarterback's eyes, gets, uh, catches the ball at the I high point. It. He is just a playmaker. So it doesn't, and this catch was just absolutely yeah. ridiculous. It was almost like the game glitched when he caught that. And then <laughs> to win the game, forced a fumble right there at the goal line versus Baylor. I mean, this kid does it all. To me, he's my odds on favor right now. And if he continues to do, what he's been doing, even if Colorado loses two or three games, I still think he should win the Heisman. I don't get it anymore, and, and nothing, like, surprises me when nothing. I watch this kid. It's going to be a fun race to watch. All right, we have to hit a, hit a quick break, but when we return, much more from us on college football, including what may be the best week of college football this season. The schedule is packed. How does a classic Red River rivalry sound, you guys? We're breaking all, down all of the big games to watch. Watch next. Keep it right here on CBS Sports HQ.